Are we on? It seems like we're on. Hello everybody, this is Dr. Mandic, and welcome to the beginning of the end. We are almost at the end of the class. This is our last unit, and um, I wanted the end to uh, be meaningful. And we're going to talk about, among other things, the meaning of life and death. And uh, that and death is an end. So we're going to be talking at the end here about the end, the end of it all. Not just the death of you, an individual, but the death of everything. Maybe the whole universe is going to come to an end. Not just the planet Earth, but the universe itself. And what sort of meaning can we find in our existence, knowing that it's just a part of this big thing that ultimately is going to die? So we're going to be t talking about things that are appropriately thought of at the end. Things like, well, what was the point of all this? Like, what can you do with philosophy? Is there any way that philosophy can make your life a life worth living? Is there any way in which philosophy can help you cope with death or the questions of the ultimate meaning of existence? And also, what if, <laughs> some of you may laugh, what if you wanted to take another philosophy class besides this one? <laughs> Uh, don't laugh. Some of you um, are thinking about it. Don't be ashamed. You're thinking like, well, this actually was somewhat kind of cool, and I might want to either take another philosophy class or at least read a little more philosophy. Maybe philosophy would become a hobby or something that you retain an interest in in the rest of your life. What happens next if you wanted to pursue this further? So these are the sorts of things that I want to talk about in these last three lectures, the last unit of the class. In uh, this lecture, lecture 26, we're going to talk about philosophy beyond the intro level. And there's a lot of it, so I'm just going to be giving you uh, some samples. And um, in lecture 27, we're going to be talking about the meaning of life and also uh, the philosophy of death, two closely related topics. And then finally, finally, in the final, final, last, last uh, lecture, lecture 28, I'm sad to say it's all going to be over. We're going to talk about... Uh, what it means to uh, have a personal philosophy and uh, what it means also to live philosophically. Maybe some of you are already have philosophical lives, like a big chunk of your life is about living philosophically. Maybe you've adopted a certain kind of philosophy long ago in connection with a religion uh, or just independently of religion. Uh, or maybe um, there's certain ethical or political things that, that inspired you to become philosophical. And for some of you, you might uh, have never really thought about it, but are thinking about getting into trying to live philosophically, and you'll get some guidance about how to do that in the last lecture. But let's go beyond and talk about what it means to go beyond. What does it mean, really, to go beyond this class? What does it mean to go beyond intro to philosophy? Well, there's three ways you can go beyond what we did here. One way you could go beyond this first one is you could do advanced work on the topics that we've already been talking about. So we've been talking about metaphysics, but just like at a very intro level, there's a whole class on metaphysics at the three or 4,000 level at this university. And there's actually lots of classes that deal with metaphysical stuff. Um, arguably, the philosophy of mind is largely a branch of metaphysics. So you could take a class in the philosophy of mind, uh, you could take a whole class in, in metaphysics. There's people writing books about this stuff. Uh, you can get into philosophy of religion. We just had like a, a, a couple lectures about the philosophy of religion, but you could take a whole class about that. Um, so one way to go beyond philosophy is to go deeper into the stuff that we were already talking about. Another way to go beyond is to talk about other things, things that we hardly touched on at all. So we didn't really get into political philosophy, but that's a huge and important part of philosophy is Polit political philosophy, the philosophical questions that arise when you wonder, like, what legitimacy is there to the state and government? Is it possible for there to be a government and for it also to be ethical? Or instead, is any kind of government actually unethical? And um, <laughs> there's some cool stuff there in political philosophy. Other topics would include feminist philosophy, philosophy about the oppression of women and ways in which you might rise up against the patriarchy. There's all sorts of areas in the philosophy of science. So you could get into the philosophy of psychology or the philosophy of physics. You could get into the philosophy of language, 
philosophical topics that best specifically just have to do with how language works. We touched on that only a little bit in this class when we were talking about truth, but you could spend a whole semester talking about things like reference and meaning, linguistic meaning, and uh, philosophical problems in how languages are learned. Um, a little bit of the stuff that we talked about in empiricism and rationalism connects to that, but there's a whole lot more that can be said about whether language is in some sense an innate knowledge that you're born with, at least born with basic grammatical categories. We did a lot of ethics in this class, but there's way more ethics that you can do, and you could do specialized ethical courses that focus on applied ethics, like medical ethics or business ethics. So uh, the second way you can go beyond intro is to just talk about other topics than the topics that we talked about here. There's so much more than what we just uh, touched on briefly this semester. And then uh, another way you can go beyond intro is to go and get into other traditions, uh, by which I mean this class has been largely focused on what gets referred to as Western philosophy, which means philosophy emanating from uh, the European traditions. Um, so we were talking a lot about Leibniz and Descartes. Those guys are from Germany and France, respectively. Some of the more recent philosophers we were dealing with were philosophers operating out of uh, America or Australia, working in English language. But the world is vast and includes way more than uh, Europe and European descended cultures, you could get into philosophy from the African continent and Africana traditions um, outside of the African continent. You could get into Latin American philosophy. There's a very long list. This is just a few samples to include, you know, for example, uh, East Asian philosophy or uh, specifically Buddhist philosophy. And you can get even more specific. There's Indo-Tibetan Buddhist philosophy. Um, so there's all sorts of different traditions than the one that we focused on. And the tradition that we were focusing on was largely European-originated uh, philosophy. So what we're going to do in the rest of this lecture is to try to grab a little bit from all three of these ways of going beyond to give you a bit of a, a sample of ways in which you can go beyond. But also it's going to connect up with lectures um, 27 and 28 too, because we're going to be talking a little bit about, for example, personal philosophies and also the meaning of life. So what we're going to do is we're going to touch on some intersections between the philosophy of mind. We're going to go more deeply into the philosophy of mind than we already did in our mind-body problem unit. We're going to get into some philosophy of science, especially philosophy of psychology. A lot of philosophers, myself included, are, are very interested in working together with scientists, especially scientists studying the mind, to try to, to, to solve problems that exist at the intersection between philosophy and science. And then uh, also we're going to be getting into non-European traditions, touching a little bit on Buddhist philosophy. And the way in which we're going to try to like touch on these three things the deeper into philosophy of mind, philosophy of psychology, and also Buddhist philosophy is by looking at mindfulness meditation, especially as it arises out of Buddhist traditions, which are um, ancient and uh, religious traditions, but also get into contemporary and secular uses of mindfulness meditation that really are quite divorced from their uh, religious origins. And there's a lot of really cool interactions between topics in uh, philosophy of mind and, and the philosophy of psychology and uh, scientific psychology and um, Buddhist tradition. So there we go. What we're going to try to do is to give you a, a taste of what's beyond introduction to philosophy by giving you uh, a bit of a, like a real brief overview of Buddhism, some discussion of mindfulness meditation that's uh, both secular uh, as well as Buddhist, and then also uh, bringing that into an area of interdisciplinary study that includes philosophers, includes scientists, called the science of consciousness. And that deals, uh, that deals in an advanced way with some of the stuff that we talked about in connection with, for example, our lecture on qualia uh, from a, a few lectures ago, lecture about, um, our lectures about dualism versus physicalism. Okay, so um, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be d dividing that into different parts. So part one, we're going to be talking about Buddhism. Part two, we're going to get into mindfulness meditation. And part three, we're going to talk about some relevant aspects from the science of consciousness, the aspects that are relevant to 
things that we are mentioning in the previous parts. So let's let's jump right in and start talking a bit about Buddhism. And um, if you're familiar with the basic ideas of Buddhism, you might appreciate what's going on in this weird meme. Well, partner, I reckon it's doggone desire what causes all this suffering. There's a focus in Buddhism on trying to eliminate human suffering. And one of the central ideas in Buddhism is that the way to do that is to try to eliminate desire. You might say, that's an interesting way to go about it. Maybe there's other ways of eliminating suffering. Uh, like, for example, eliminate all the things that cause suffering. Right? So, um, people doing bad things, that causes suffering. Let's lock them up. And, and uh, there's a bunch of diseases that cause suffering. Let's cure those diseases. And there's all sorts of um, economic problems. Maybe we should solve those. Uh, but then there's this interesting approach that in kind of one fell swoop says, you know, you know what causes suffering? Wanting. If you want things, that will lead you one way or another to being disappointed, to, to feeling a lack, which is itself a kind of suffering. So maybe the way to eliminate suffering is to eliminate desire. And that really is the central idea, or at least central philosophical idea, at the heart of Buddhism. And I should also mention before we go uh, deeper into this that Buddhism is, uh, while it does have religious uh, religious traditions, uh, various kinds of Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, um, for example, uh, these are all different kinds of, of religion. There's also a philosophy that is identifiably Buddhist philosophy. And we're going to be focusing on the philosophical ideas that come from Buddhism. And at the heart of Buddhism is something that gets referred to as the Four Noble Truths. And one way of expressing these Four Noble Truths is as we have here. So number one, life is full of suffering. And number two, suffering comes from desire or wanting. And number three, suffering stops when desire or wanting stops. And finally, in order to stop these desires or wants, you have to follow something called the Eightfold Path. And to relate this stuff to things that we studied earlier in the class, we might say that at the, at the heart of the philosophical project of Buddhism is something that we would recognize as a kind of consequentialist ethics. When we were doing our ethics unit, we talked about how there's three main kinds of ethical theory. Uh, one of which is consequentialist ethical theory, and that includes, as examples of consequentialism, utilitarianism, but also hedonism. Um, and there's other kinds of consequentialism besides. And so here we can see Buddhism is essentially a kind of consequentialism. Think about, for example, utilitarianism. Utilitarianism said there's really one end like all the things that you could seek in life ultimately are just leading to one thing and what it is is to maximize your happiness. And so what, what makes something right or wrong is whether it maximizes happiness. And further, utilitarianism has this wrinkle that distinguishes it from hedonism. You're not just maximizing your own happiness or pleasure. You're trying to maximize the amount of pleasure for the, for, um, the population overall. But here we have a very different kind of end and that is not to maximize pleasure, but instead to eliminate suffering. That's a very different sort of thing. Maximizing pleasure is to increase a positive thing, but to end suffering is to decrease a negative thing. Those are two different things. And you might wonder, well, which one is a better strategy? Which one is a more stable strategy? Um, and one thing that's interesting to think about is the origin of all of this stuff and this stuff is supposed to have originated from someone who gets referred to as the Buddha. One of the things that we're going to spend a little bit of time about is learning uh, the brief elements of the life of uh, the, the person who became known as the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, and uh, this brief video will give you uh, a, a quick rundown of the life of the Buddha. We know Buddhism today as the fourth largest religion in the world. It was also the first world religion, and while 360 million people follow the way of Buddhism now, 
Over 2,500 years ago, it was just one man who started it all. This man was born around 520 BC to King Shuddhadana Gautama and his wife Queen Mahamaya in what is now southern Nepal. According to tradition, the baby was born fully awake and able to talk. When he spoke, he said he'd been born to free mankind from suffering. When he walked, lotus blossoms bloomed in his footsteps. They named him Siddhartha, which means he who has attained his goals. When King Shuddhodana consulted a seer about the future of his son, he was told Siddhartha would be one of two things, a great king or a great sage and savior of humanity. Shuddhodana was determined for his son to be a king like himself, so he resolved to shield Siddhartha from anything that would inspire him to dedicate his life to religion. So Siddhartha spent his days in the palace, surrounded by beauty and health. He was carefully kept away from the elderly, the sick, the dead, and anyone who had dedicated his life to spirituality. He trained in the arts of war and married a beautiful princess when he was just 16 years old, but grew increasingly restless to see his people and his lands beyond the palace walls. After much begging from his son, the king carefully arranged a tour of the capital for him, making sure to avoid any glimpses of suffering or death by asking only young and healthy people to greet the young prince. As Siddhartha was led through the capital, he noticed two old men who had accidentally wandered too close to the parade. He left the procession and chased after the men in amazement to find out more about them. In pursuing them, he happened upon a group of severely ill people suffering and in pain. Lastly, he came to a funeral ceremony near the river where, for the very first time in his life, he saw death. Confused and bewildered, Siddhartha asked his squire what had happened to these people, and his squire sadly informed him of the simple truths of life that Siddhartha had never known. Everyone gets old, everyone gets sick, and everyone eventually dies. Seeing the harsh realities of life, Siddhartha realized he could never be happy living life as he had been for the past 29 years. Now that he had discovered suffering, he vowed to find a way to overcome it in order to help others. He bid goodbye to his sleeping wife and newborn son, snuck out of the palace, cut his long hair, and gave away his expensive clothing. Siddhartha then spent years studying and practicing with famous gurus and ascetics. He chose to adopt a lifestyle of pain and suffering in an attempt to gain wisdom and freedom. When his efforts failed, Siddhartha drove himself even further into the practice by refusing food and water until he was nearly dead. He realized that this state of suffering brought about nothing but delusions and doubts, rather than clarity, and he resolved to find the middle ground between extreme luxury and the painful ascetic lifestyle. So Siddhartha ate, drank, and bathed again. Now 35 years old and once again healthy, Siddhartha came to a fig tree where he decided he would sit for as long as it would take for the answers to the problems of suffering to come. He sat for many days. Eventually, he began to recall all of his previous lives and was able to see everything that was going on in the entire universe. With the rising of the morning star on the full moon of May, Siddhartha finally understood the answer to the question of suffering. At that moment, he became the Buddha, which means he who is awake. His enlightenment helped him understand that there are four noble truths which center around the idea of dukkha, which means suffering and anxiety. He also came to understand the Eightfold Path, which describes the way to reach the end of dukkha and find enlightenment. The Buddha traveled all over the land, spreading the teachings of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path to enlightenment. His community of followers grew, eventually including his wife, son, and father as well. To the Buddha, all were capable of enlightenment, no matter what their status or background or wealth. The Buddha would teach throughout Northeast India for another 45 years and lived to be 80 years old. Just before his death, he went into a deep meditation under a grove of solid trees and spoke these words. Impermanent are all created things. Strive on with awareness. So, um, 
at the heart of Buddhism, you've got this kind of consequential, consequentialist ethic where you're trying to eliminate suffering, and you get this recommendation for how to eliminate suffering, and that is by following the Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path has to do with, you might say, things that kind of look like virtues, trying to have uh, the right actions and the right speech and the right intentions and the right views and the right mindfulness and the right concentration and the right effort. Those eight different virtues are what are supposed to lead you to the elimination of suffering. And you might say, wait a minute, you're emphasizing virtues, does that make it a virtue ethic? And the answer is no, because just because you're talking about virtues doesn't mean it's a virtue ethic. What makes it a virtue ethic is, what makes something virtue ethics is if virtues are the most basic thing in your analysis of general ethical questions. But here we've got something that makes the most, the, the most basic thing is the elimination of suffering. That's the most important thing. That's the goal of it all. And that is a consequence. It is not a virtue. So this is a consequentialist ethic that, like other ethics, happens to talk about virtue without necessarily being virtue ethics. Now, one of the things that you will note in these um, uh, these um, elements is reference to things like mindfulness or concentration. And in the story of the Buddha, he meditated. When he went and he sat under the tree, he was meditating. And a lot of people think of Buddhist practice as having to do with something called meditation. And some of you might meditate already. You may have learned meditation on your own, or maybe you have learned meditation as a part of your um, as part of your workout. Like you use it to relax, or you use it as a, a part of a, a, a strategy to enhance athletic performance, or maybe you use it as a stress reduction strategy, or it's been something that's been recommended to you by a therapist to try to decrease anxiety. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, meditation in connection with Buddhism, but also outside of Buddhism. So in the Buddhist uh, tradition, what's meditation supposed to be doing? We might say that meditation is, is doing a thing that we can recognize as being philosophical three times over. Recall from our earlier discussions of the definition of philosophy is that philosophy has three branches, one of which is epistemology, one of which is metaphysics, and one of which is ethics. And in meditation, get something that combines all three. So meditation provides an epistemology, a, a way of gaining knowledge, and the way that is supposed to work is something that you might recognize as somewhat empiricistic, having to do with experience. Meditation provides an epistemology of direct experience, and that also should remind you of direct realism as opposed to indirect realism. A direct experience of what? Of metaphysical truths. What sort of metaphysical truths? Well, metaphysical truths that when you concentrate on them or become aware of them or have direct experience of them, they will transform you into being more ethical and behaving more ethically and thinking more ethically. So meditation is supposed to provide an epistemology of direct experience of metaphysical truths that inspire ethical behavior and thought. But what kind of, like what, meta, what metaphysical truths? What's metaphysical about these truths and why would they inspire anything ethical when you contemplate them? Well, recall one of the, meta, one of the metaphysical issues that we discussed in uh, the earlier part of the semester is the metaphysics of the self. What does it mean to have a self? What does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a person that exists over time? We briefly touched on the idea that there's this view that says there is no such thing as the self. One version of that is something that we got from David Hume. Recall from lecture nine, David Hume said that when he goes looking for the self, like he looks inward, he introspects, and all he can find is a bundle of perceptions. He doesn't find a perceiver that has the perceptions. We get a similar kind of idea from Buddhism. Uh, we get a doctrine of anatman as opposed to atman. Anatman is the doctrine of no self. And it's a very similar sort of idea. It's a rejection of any kind of permanent or static entity that underlies a person's constantly changing physical and mental attributes. And the sort of idea that you, that, that you get, or you are supposed to get, is when you meditate, you concentrate 
on your experiences and you realize there is no there is no self there's just these changing experiences and you don't just think that thought you don't just think to yourself oh there's no self you try to have an experience of there not being a self and when you have that experience that's supposed to be very liberating it liberates you from worrying about things like what's going to happen to you tomorrow or or that what's that thing that person said about you at that party last week when you experience your yourself as not really being real you let go of all those things and that's supposed to be something that puts you on the path of liberation and it's supposed to be very freeing and freeing from the sorts of desires that lead to suffering and lead to unethical uh, behaviors and thoughts and lead to the suffering of, of not just yourself but the suffering of others I'm going to make a, 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 a brief remark uh Oh, by the way, this is a little, I guess this is a little bit of, sorry, <laughs> uh, this is a little bit of review of some stuff that we were just saying now and, and stuff that we were saying um, earlier in the semester when we were talking about people like Hume and Descartes. Um, this is just a little bit of review about the contrast between uh, the self view that you get from someone like Descartes and the no self view. Um, so you might say the Buddha and Hume agree that there are no selves because there are no substances. There's just this constant change, and you become aware of that when you meditate, when you concentrate on your own experience instead of just taking things for granted in a literal sense of thing. You pay attention to experience itself. You see experience is just constant change. But with Descartes, you get this emphasis not on experience but on the rational intellect. Where We're going to see in contrast with meditation epistemology there's a de-emphasis on the rational intellect and in, a, in, a, in a, a sense a kind of an irrational emphasis on experience what I'd like to do now is take a, 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 a quick look at this video um, this is an interview of someone named Sam Harris who has an interest in meditation published a book on it and in this interview he's talking about his experiences with meditation and how they relate to consciousness He's going to be talking a little bit about uh, similarities and differences between meditative states of consciousness and the sorts of states of consciousness that one might experience on various kinds of psychedelic drugs. And he's going to be making uh, some uh, connection to points we were discussing earlier about how the meditative experience might lead to certain kinds of ethical insights. Okay, welcome back. Let's jump into part two and talk more about mindfulness meditation with a uh, not necessarily Buddhist emphasis, but more broadly uh, a general kind of uh, view of what meditation or mindfulness might be or might do. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some basic techniques of, of mindfulness meditation. If it's, if it's something that you've never tried before, well, you're going to be able to try this on your own if you want. There's not a whole lot to the basics. You might say there's really only two basic techniques that you have to use to try to do mindfulness meditation. The two techniques are to pay attention and don't think. And we might really briefly put it like this. like So suppose you were going to try to meditate for one minute. Just one minute. It's not like a big chunk of your day. Just meditate for one minute. Well, um, what are you going to do during that minute? Well, one thing you might do is pick pick something to pay attention to. And it could be something simple like a candle flame or just a corner of your desk or a, a little spot on the wall. Um, or you might close your eyes and just pay attention to the feeling of your breath going in and out of your nostrils. Just pay attention to that. And whenever you catch your attention wandering you try to get your attention back on that thing that you were paying attention to and the other technique that you can be doing at the exact same time is to try to not think so you might be sitting there trying to pay attention to the, the feeling of your breath in your nostrils and you keep on finding all these thoughts arising you start thinking about nostrils and, and, and that leads you to think about nose hairs and the one time you got a zit inside of your nose and how painful it was and how embarrassing it was when someone saw you with that zit and then you're thinking about um, zits in general and how you knew uh, this one girl in high school who had like really bad acne and and uh, she eventually um, 
the acne went away and she looked like a completely different person and, and uh, you were really close friends with her and, and that reminds you of this. And your mind just keeps going to all these different places and you gotta say, all right, stop thinking. And just bring it back and try to clear your mind. And when you first try this, it seems really hard and that's why maybe you should only try doing it for one minute. Um, but eventually you get good at it. Eventually, just like a little kid can figure out how to not uh, how to not pee in their pants they can control their bladder you can control your mind and you can control your mind from constantly just wandering and constantly thinking so one way of thinking about what mindfulness meditation is is just based on these two techniques pay attention and don't think but a more elaborate way of putting it is something that we could spell out and um, one thing you could do is get a hold of a recording of someone walking you through some basic steps, and that would be something called a guided meditation. What these steps are, are um, some very uh, very simple guided meditation uh, written by Sam Harris, someone who I was just mentioning a little bit earlier. And um, this is something that you could try on your own. And uh, we've got just basically eight steps. And you might listen to somebody saying these steps while you close your eyes or, or just stare at something and listen and try to follow the steps. So let's go through this together. Sit comfortably with your spine erect, either in a chair or cross-legged on a cushion. Close your eyes, take a few deep breaths, and feel the points of contact between your body and the chair or the floor. Notice the sensations associated with sitting feelings of pressure, warmth, tingling, vibration, etc. Gradually become aware of the process of breathing. Pay attention to wherever you feel the breath most distinctly, either at your nostrils or in the rising and falling of your abdomen. Allow your attention to rest in the mere sensation of breathing. You don't have to control your breath, just let it come and go naturally. Every time your mind wanders in thought, gently return it to the breath. As you focus on the process of breathing, you will also perceive sounds, bodily sensations, or emotions. Simply observe these phenomena as they appear in consciousness, and then return to the breath. The moment you notice that you have been lost in thought, observe the present thought itself as an object of consciousness, then return your attention to the breath or to any sounds or sensations arising in the next moment. Continue in this way until you can merely witness all objects of consciousness, sights, sounds, sensations, emotions, even thoughts themselves as they arise, change, and pass away. So that's something that you might do in just a, just one minute, or that's something that you might stretch out into a 10 minute meditation. There are people that meditate even uh, longer than that at a, at a given sitting. And that's just a basic meditative exercise. There's all sorts of other meditative exercises. One interesting one to think about is a kind of meditation known as loving kindness meditation. And this is dedicated, uh, this is adapted uh, from a book called The Buddha's Brain, which is a really cool book. It is something that looks at traditional meditative practices in light of what we know about how the brain works. So instead of meditating on the breath or a visual image, meditate on the feeling of loving kindness. And what the feeling of loving kindness is, is something like, um, like it's not romantic love. It's loving kindness is like the, the feeling that you might have for any of your family members. I mean, you know, the ones you like, um, you might have a feeling of loving kindness or uh, a, 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 you might have it especially intensely for young uh, family members. So you've got like a, a, a niece or a nephew, or maybe you have your own children and you, and you, you know, you have this feeling of loving kindness for your children. This is the kind of uh, love that Christians talk about the, the, when they say love, love thy neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. And you're supposed to focus on the feeling 
not just thinking about the abstract idea of loving kindness, like, oh, yes, one should be good to one's neighbor, but to, like, get the feeling inside of you. And how are you going to do that? Like, you're just going to think about a stranger and try to feel love towards them? That might be difficult. So what you should do is start off with someone who you really, really have an easy time getting that feeling for and focus on them in your mind and really focus on feeling that feeling. And you might even visualize that feeling as something that is like an energy that is coming out of you and connects to that person. And now try to think of other people, people that maybe you don't have that intense of a feeling for. But now in your mind or your imagination, try to extend that feeling to those people so that now you're feeling that loving feeling to not just these these like awesome nephews and nieces that you have that are really cute and innocent but also like uncle larry who's a bit of a jerk but you know you're he's family and you know you put up with them try to extend the feeling to him and then go beyond that to try to extend the feeling to complete strangers and then maybe even go beyond that and to try to extend the feeling to people who are total assholes people that really you kind of hate and and you are right to hate them but for this moment you're going to extend a feeling of loving kindness to even them and you are supposed to do this on a regular basis and it's supposed to change you it's supposed to transform you it's supposed to transform the way you feel in general about your life and your existence amongst other people let's switch now and talk about some elements from the science of consciousness that are relevant to thinking about meditation. Some of this comes from philosophy, uh, uh, some of this comes from uh, scientific stuff, um, but all of it comes with, from this general strategy of combining various disciplines to understand the nature of consciousness. So a lot of this is like advanced philosophy of mind and a lot of it is like neuroscience. From philosophy of mind, it, we get this thing that we touched on a little bit in lecture 23 and that's the idea of intentionality. A lot of the contemporary discussion of intentionality comes from Franz Brentano, who emphasized intentionality as being the most basic aspect of any mental state. We called it aboutness. It's that aspect of, for example, thoughts, like when you're thinking about the Eiffel Tower, that's the aboutness of that thought. The thought is directed at or pointed at the Eiffel Tower. It's the directedness of the mind toward its objects. And this applies not just to thoughts, but it applies to hopes and fears. And when you have a hope, there's something that you hope for. When you have a fear, there's something you're afraid of. So you're afraid of spiders. There's your mind on the one hand, and then there's the spiders on the other hand. And intentionality is that directedness of the mind upon its objects. And Bertano suggested that intentionality was the mark of the mental, meaning that what it means to be mental is to have intentionality. All things that have intentionality are mental, and all things that are mental have intentionality, according to Brentano. And one of the things that's interesting about intentionality is it allows us to draw a distinction between what the mental state is about and the mental state itself. So right now you might be wondering what's going to happen tomorrow, but that wondering is not happening tomorrow. The wondering is happening today. And it's useful to be able to, to detach ourselves sometimes from the contents of our mental states. So you might say, like, you're really angry and you're really focused on this jerk that made you angry, this person that cut you off in, in traffic. But, like, you know what? Forget about that person. Let's just focus on this mental state. This is just a thing that's happening inside of you. And can't that thing that's inside of you, can't you change it? Like that person, they're, who knows where they are? You can't change them. Maybe you shouldn't. You shouldn't tr track them down. <laughs> Leave them alone. Focus on, focus on yourself. And you've got this mental state, and now there maybe are things that you could do to change your mental state. One interesting set of divisions about mental states and their intentionality is first we can distinguish between mental states that are higher order versus first order and this might remind you of some stuff that we talked about back when we were talking about compatibilism in the theory of free will and we were talking about Harry Frankfurt's hierarchy of desires model of free will and there we were distinguishing between higher order desires and lower order desires an example of a lower order desire is for example a desire for a bottle of beer 
uh, an example of a higher order desire would be a desire about desires. Like I might desire to lo no longer desire to drink beer because I want to lose weight. In general, we can distinguish between higher order mental states and, and lower order mental states. So for example, there might be thoughts like you might think there is a tree in the yard or you might pause and think about your thinking. You might think to yourself, I am thinking that there's a tree in the yard. So there's one distinction we can draw between mental states or states of awareness, and that is between first order and higher order awareness. Another distinction we can draw is, is instead of first order versus higher order, and that is conceptual versus non-conceptual. One way to get a handle on what the distinction between conceptual and non-conceptual awareness is, is to think about language and the sorts of aspects of your thoughts that you could put into language. Or another way of putting it, the aspects of thoughts that you kind of would have to have language in order to have. So compare yourself to a dog. There's all sorts of things that you can think about that a dog can't think about. Like for example, you can't think about Wednesdays. I'm sorry, the dog can't think about Wednesdays. You can think about Wednesdays all you want. You understand what Wednesdays are and their relationships to Tuesdays. You understand what February is and how February uh, sometimes has an extra day in it. And a dog can't think about any of those things. A dog can't understand that it has its birthday in February. A dog cannot become aware of Wednesdays as such. A dog can only be aware of things like there's food. There's food right in front of me. Uh, there's some food over there too. I can't wait till I get some food again. But you can be aware of the sorts of things that you can express in language. And those are things that you have concepts of. You have a concept of Wednesdays. And we might say animals often don't have concepts. One different way of getting a handle on the distinction between conceptual and non-conceptual awareness is to think about aspects of your awareness that you have no concept for. So for example, there are all sorts of shades of color that you have no concept of like you don't have a distinct concept for all the like you have a concept of red and you have a concept of light and dark and I can show you different shades of light and dark red but you don't know that this shade of dark is puce and the, or this shade of red is crimson you might know not know what the difference between scarlet and crimson is those are words you heard of but you don't really have a concept of scarlet some people do, like an interior designer might have all sorts of concepts that you don't have for colors. Or someone who's a professional wine taster might have all sorts of concepts for flavors of wine that you don't have. You're just like, I like red wine, I like white wine, I like pink wine, the end. Um, so you might appreciate then that there is more to awareness than can be conceptualized, that can be put into thought. There's this raw awareness that you can share with a baby could share with an animal. By share, I mean you, the baby and the animal can have it also. There's some sense in which both you and a dog can be aware of a tree. Now only you can be aware that the tree is a birch instead of an elm. That's conceptual where the dog is just like, there's a tree, I'm going to pee on it. Another thing worth remarking on is that it looks like higher, like probably higher order awareness is conceptual. It requires being conceptual that if you didn't have concepts then you wouldn't be able to have a con you wouldn't be able to be aware of thoughts as they are you have thoughts but you're not necessarily aware that you have thoughts like a dog doesn't know that it's thinking the dog can't think to itself i think therefore i exist it has thoughts it just doesn't know that it has thoughts it doesn't have any higher order conceptual awareness okay what's the point of all this for meditation What's the point of dist distinguishing between first order and higher order awareness or conceptual versus non-conceptual awareness? And one way we, we might put it is that the main goal of mindfulness meditation is to increase your ability to have this kind of raw, direct, non-conceptual, first order awareness of things. An awareness that is clean and pure. It is it is not dirtied by all this extra thinking. Remember the, the, the instruction, don't think. So part of what you're doing when you're meditating is trying to get rid of all the extra higher order thoughts like thinking, 
I'm thinking that there's a tree in the yard right now. You're just trying to be aware of the tree in the yard. Not thinking about being aware of the tree in the yard. You might say, isn't that a paradox? Isn't meditation itself a paradox? Aren't you trying to not try? Aren't you thinking about non-thinking? And the answer to the question is, mm. <laughs> that's the answer. Let's talk about the, uh, a different angle on consciousness and how mindfulness meditation connects to it. So one way of thinking about what you're doing with mindfulness meditation is that you are trying to take control of this cycle that I have represented here. And what's the cycle? It's a cycle that involves causal relationships between what you think, which is conceptual, what you experience, which is non-conceptual and also first order. And then there's this other aspect of the mind, which is attention itself, what you attend to. What you attend to has effects on what you experience and what you experience has effects on what you think. And this cycle might be, in a lot of ways, not working for you. Maybe you have a bunch of like negative thoughts, and those negative thoughts affect what you pay attention to. You might be paying attention to things that put you in an even worse mood, and you have even more negative experiences, and that gives you even more negative thoughts, and you just become much more miserable, and then you can only concentrate on certain things that just make it even worse, and there's this cycle of badness. But maybe you could take control of this cycle and make it into a cycle of goodness. And what I want to talk about next is the ways in which it's true. Like maybe you aren't convinced that what you attend to affects what you experience. Maybe you're not convinced that what you experience affects what you think or what you think affects what you intend to. And what I want to move to next is examples that illustrate how actually all, the, all three of those claims is true. So let's start with this claim, the claim that what you experience affects what you think or it has effects on what you think. And a lot of you might already be convinced of that because I know a lot of you are, based on papers that you wrote and I read, a lot of you are empiricists. And you might say that's just the basic precept of empiricism, that what you experience affects what you think or has effects on what you think. And I appreciate that maybe I should have used the word A-F-F-E-C-T-S instead of E-F-F-E-C-T-S. And for those of you who don't know the difference between those two different spellings and those two different words, don't worry about it. There's an arrow leading from the one to the other. Um, but for those of you who are worried about the difference between effects and affects, what we're saying is that this affects with an A, this, but you might as well say this has effects on this. And it's really the same thing. Anyway, uh, sorry to be pedantic, but I am a professor after all. Let's focus on the claim that what you attend to has effects on what you experience. So here's a cool, uh, here's a cool demonstration. So um, look at this black dot right here. And without moving your eyes, move your attention. And notice the way it changes what it's like to have the experience that you're having. Remember when we were talking about qualia in the unit about property dualism, and we were talking about qualia in terms of the phrase, what it's like, like what it's like to be a bat, what it's like for Mary to see red. Well, I want you to pay attention to what it's like to have this visual experience of this picture while you are focusing on the black dot and now i want you to without moving your eyes just focus your attention on the fact that there's a picture of a house here I, I know there's also a picture of a face but now just attend to the house without moving your eyes attend to how the house has columns attend to how many floors the house must have attend to whether you're looking at the front of the house versus the back of the house and now without moving your eyes away from that black dot, I want you to shift your attention to the picture of the man's face and how this uh, is probably a young man and not an old man. And without moving your eyes, attend to the question of whether he has any facial hair. And note that you could just sit here and do this and attend to the house. Now attend to the face. House, face. And it changes your experience. You might feel like when you attend to the house, your experience of the face fades and vice versa. 
when you attend to the face, the experience of the house fades. And this is illustrating something that maybe now seems really obvious to you, namely that what you attend to affects, has effects on what you experience. Here's another example of effects from attention on experience. Okay, so um, what you're going to see is that you can alter the brightness of a disc by attending to it while keeping your eyes fixed on one of the dots. Okay, so let's look at uh, figure A. So if we're looking up here at figure A, um, I want you to keep your eyes focused on the white dot right here in the center. And now I want you to shift your attention without moving your eyes to one of the discs. And many of you will notice that when you attend one of the discs, it gets darker. So you're staring at the white dot and you're shifting your attention to the bottom disc and the, makes the bottom disc seem darker. And then you shift your attention to the right upper right disc and the right disc gets darker. And then you shift your attention to the left disc and the left disc gets darker. That's kind of cool. And what is it illustrating? It's illustrating that what you attend to can have effects on what you experience. Here's one more example. Um, if you, uh, before we start, just notice that we've got these, these uh, regions of the gray display where you get these, you see these kind of like ripples of light and darkness. Um, we're calling these uh, patches, specifically Gabor patches, but don't worry about that. Uh, so we've got this one patch over here and this one patch over here. Um, now, um, you might look at this patch and this patch and realize one of them is, is looks different. Uh, they look different from one another. And what's going on here is that um, if you know much about photography or image processing, you know about contrast, and some images are high contrast, some are low contrast. And what we hear, have here is a 22% contrast Gabor patch versus a 28% contrast Gabor patch. And you can kind of see the difference. But if you just focus on the, with your eyes on the black dot and you move your attention to the leftmost patch, you can make its apparent contrast increase even though it's really 22%, it will look to you like it's 28% contrast. Again, what you attend to has effects on what you experience. So you focus on the black dot in the center. Without moving your eyes, you move your attention to the patch on the left, and you'll see that it looks more like the patch on the right. Here's a slightly different effect, which has to do with how the distance between uh, the patch and the line changes. Here's another example of how attention can change your experience, and that is um, the next time you have a pain, and I don't mean the kind of pain that would send you to um, the emergency room. If you have one of those, you should just go to the emergency room and forget about philosophy. But the next thing you have a minor pain, like you actually bite your mouth or you sprain your ankle or something like that, do this little meditation, and that is to focus on the pain. Attend to the pain where you let the pain be fully absorbed by your attention and let your attention fully absorb the pain. And whenever your mind starts to wander from the pain, make it go back to the pain. Many people have the experience that when they do this, the pain becomes less painful. It's almost like the mind gets tired of thinking about the pain and it makes the pain go away. It fades from consciousness. The pain is like, the mind is like, ah, all right, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of feeling that pain. Okay, so we're almost done thinking about the, the three different parts of this uh, triangle. Finally, let's talk about how what you think affects what you attend to. And some of you, maybe, uh, especially if you've been in psychology classes, you might be familiar with this, but some of you have not seen this before. But what we're going to do is we're going to watch a brief video. And when you watch the video, I want you to pay attention to the basketball and try to mentally count how many times the basketball gets passed. And when we come back from watching the video, I want to ask you 
what number you came up with. Okay, so you go ahead and watch that, and I'll talk to you later. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching on DVDs from VizCog Productions. Learn more at theinvisiblegorilla.com. Okay, so um, if you've seen this video in a psychology class, you might note the funny, cool thing. And that is, a lot of people didn't see the gorilla. And maybe you are one of them. You might be wondering, wait, what? What gorilla? Well, once you go back and watch that video again, you're going to see that there's a gorilla in it or someone in a gorilla suit. A lot of people are concentrating so hard on the basketballs being passed that they do not notice the gorilla at all. And if you've been one of those people, you know that that's, that's a really interesting thing about this experiment. Um, I've, I've done this demonstration in classes before where I had like 50 students in the class and fully uh, half of the students didn't see the gorilla at all. Here's another video illustrating a, a similar sort of thing having to do with how much what you think about will affect what you attend to and thus what you will fail to notice. This is a movie perception test. Watch this brief video of a conversation and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Hi Sabina. Hi. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Yeah, it's great to see you, Andrea. So how did you get here? Oh, I took the subway from Middleton, and it took only about half an hour. Really? I drove from Gresham, and it took 45 minutes. Hmm, hooray for public transportation. So why did you call me here for this mysterious meeting? I'm planning a surprise party for Jerome, and I need your help to keep him away from the house. That's great. I'll do anything you need. Good. I hate surprise parties, but only when I'm the victim. Otherwise, they're great. Very good. Other than the strange dialogue about a surprise party, did you notice anything unusual? In our book, The Invisible Gorilla and Other Ways Our Intuitions Deceive Us, we discuss the illusion of memory. We think we perceive and remember more of our world than we actually do. The movie you just watched had nine intentional editing mistakes. Did you spot any of them? Watch it again. Notice that the woman on the right, Sabrina, is wearing a scarf. In a moment we'll have a close-up and the scarf will be gone. Notice the scarf is gone and Andrea, the woman on the left, has her arm on the table. Now it's at her chin. Scarf is back. Notice that the plates are red. Now they're white and Andrea's arm is back on the table. Now they're red and Sabrina's arm is off of the table. Notice that the food is in front of Sabrina. Now it's in front of Andrea. The cups and the spoon have also switched places, and Sabrina's arm is on the table when it wasn't before. Most people don't notice any of the changes, a phenomenon known as change blindness. But most people are confident that they would notice the changes. That is the illusion of memory. Check out our book, The Invisible Gorilla, to learn more. www.theinvisiblegorilla.com Okay, it's time to start wrapping things up. Uh, let's put this all together. So we've been talking about consciousness and meditation and, and Buddhism. And how do they all fit together? Well, we've got these two techniques from mindfulness meditation. Just pay attention and try to not think. 
And one way of thinking about what that is doing is that it's allowing you to take control of the cycle where what you think can affect what you attend to, which can affect what you experience, which can affect what you think. And ideally, it will take control, you'll be able to take control of that in a way that will promote the alleviation of suffering, that will allow you to free yourself from desire. And if you no longer have desire, then you will no longer ever be disappointed. Okay, let's talk about our discussion questions and then call it a day. Uh, uh, study questions. Study question number one, which is one of the four noble truths of Buddhism? A, if God existed, then no suffering would exist. B, what makes an action morally right is if it maximizes suffering in the population as a whole. C, suffering comes from desire. D, your actions are determined by your greatest desire. E, always remember what the Buddha said to the hot dog vendor, make me one with everything. Study question two, which one is one of the two basic, sorry, which is one of the two basic techniques of mindful meditation? A, don't eat the yellow snow. B, don't panic. C, don't drop kick a baby. D, don't speak. E, don't think. Three, which is a better example of a non-conceptual mental state than of a conceptual mental state? A, a higher order awareness that you can think of the difference between a kiliagon and a circle even though you cannot see the difference. B, a fear that your best friend thinks your birthday is this Wednesday instead of next Wednesday. C, a preference for the B theory of time over the A theory. D, a desire to be the best violin player in North America. E, a visual experience of redness. And what are the answers? What are the answers? Those are the answers. The answers are C, E, and E which you might say spells, see you later, bye-bye.